The way it happened to me is um, I knew, in fact, I'd predicted on AM um, what was going to happen because I got a, mo uh, a, a text message from one of my Fijian colleagues over there um, when one of the radio stations, because they couldn't report themselves, they reported that I was reporting that there was censorship, according to Dorney, uh, is the way they put it on the radio. They were then ordered to take that news story off air, but I got a text message from someone saying, brace yourself, you'll be deported. And that was a friendly, that wasn't someone in the military sending me that. Um, and it did happen the next day. I was sitting in a coffee shop with um, another terrific Fijian journalist just having a bit of a chat. And um, up on the screen in the coffee shop we were in, in downtown uh, Suva, came my story that I'd done for Australia Network the night before. Australia Network is the foreign service of the ABC. It's like Radio Australia, but for television. And um, Fiji One, when it is not running its own programs, defaults to our service. So Australia Network gets run in Fiji on every television station. Well, the story I did from the night before for television, which was all about the Fiji Times' efforts to object to the censorship and an interview with Daryl Tart, another extraordinarily brave man who's the chairman of the Fiji Media Council, in which he said, this is total censorship and this is what you expect in a police or a military state. Um, that story was on the screen the next morning while we were sitting in the coffee shop. Within 10 minutes, I got a phone call from someone I've known for a long time, uh, a civilian <coughs> official in the information department. Um, he rang me up saying, Sean, we'd like to discuss your reporting with you. Could you please come in? And I said, I'll be there in 15 minutes. So I finished having the coffee and um, this Fijian journalist said, please let me know what's going on. And I went there and he was very, you know, uh, civil. He just said, look, Major Lewenny doesn't like your reporting. Um, there are going to be immigration officials coming to pick you up and take you to the airport and send you out of the country. And I said, well, Penne, I was expecting that. Um, can I go back to the hotel and pack? And he said, yes. So it was only a short walk, you know, 250 metres perhaps from the information office to the hotel I was staying in. So I went back there and while I was packing I got on the phone and told the ABC and told the Australian High Commissioner, James Batley, who I've known since the early 1980s, and um, did a few interviews. Did an interview with this journalist who I'd been with in the coffee shop and she strings for Radio New Zealand International and she sent the interview off. I did an interview with Edwin Nand, um, the Fiji One journalist who later spent two nights in police, in, uh, police custody for having done it. Um, and about two hours later, or in between time, they rang me up and said, oh, look, um, seeing you're so willing to go, <laughs> would you be happy to leave voluntarily? <laughs> and I said, no, Penne, I'm here to report. My visa's valid for at least two more days, three more days. Um, I'm going to keep reporting. If you want to get rid of me, get rid of me, but I'm, my job is to report the news. <laughs> so about an hour after that, he then rang me up saying, could you come in again? And that's when I went in and they confiscated our phones and whatever. I didn't feel um, as though I was going to be beaten up. My concern was that if they had handed me over to the military, that could well have happened. Because the military have killed people in custody since the coup in 2006. And one of the judges who sentenced some soldiers to prison just a few weeks ago for that killing has now been sacked along with every other judge in Fiji. So my concern was not with the people in the information office and certainly not later when they handed over me to the migration people. Um, but my concern was if I had ended up at the military barracks because I have spoken to quite a few people who have had some very torrid times at the military barracks. The only time I thought we were really getting into trouble was when the TV3 cameraman from New Zealand thought he could surreptitiously film what was going on. Um, the information officer knew exactly what he was doing. 
Um, I couldn't believe it when he thought he didn't have a good enough angle and pushed his seat back to get a better angle <laughs> while he... <laughs> Um, and I just, I just said to the two TV3 people when he had left the room, I said, look, we're dealing with someone who's civil. Um, don't be silly. This could get really dangerous and I'll come in and kick your camera to pieces. So, you know, what we've got to do is not provoke these people um, because this can deteriorate into a really dangerous situation. So don't try and be smart. What we need to do is just be sensible. Because we'll get to report all of this later. You don't need the sneaky shot from under the table that's going to result in us all having broken teeth. So anyway, they then got him out of the room, uh, demanded that he delete everything he shot. Um, he came back again. They took him out again. Eventually, he did delete everything they've got because they had threatened that they would conduct a search of his female journalist. Um, after five hours, we were handed over to the migration guys and they then took us to the migration department. I was held, we were separated, I was held in the car park. Um, an Australian consular official came and stood 20 metres away, 30 metres away, and he was yelling out, are you okay? And I said I was fine. Um, he had my wife's phone number, rang up my wife and told her I was okay. I said, I'm not sure when I'm going out, but it'll be sometime tomorrow, probably first flight to Australia, which it turned out to be the flight to Sydney. In fact, when I got the next day with these two rather large immigration officials and an even more enormous um, <laughs> airport security guy, they took me to a special counter to be processed. And the Air Pacific girl behind the counter said, I, I can see a booking for Dorney for the flight to Sydney, but there's no ticket. And I said, well, actually, if you go into the system, you will find I do have a ticket, but it's to Brisbane and it's for much later. She subsequently found it and got on the phone and uh, came back from talking to the people organising it. And they said, they want to know why you've changed your flight. <laughs> <laughs> These guys, no. <laughs> yeah, so um, anyway, we, we got flown out. They were very civil, the, the uh, migration guys, even to the extent of saying uh, the previous night, the Monday night, when we got to Suva, um, you can stay in the detention centre or you can pay your own way in a hotel and we'll just make sure you don't use the phone. So these New Zealanders wanted to stay in the hotel. I was wanting to go to the detention centre. But anyway, no, we all <laughs> stayed in the hotel. And they took us to the airport and flew us out. But as I said before, um, it's all right for me to jump on a plane and get out of there. There are some exceptionally brave Fijian journalists. And I'll just tell you what happened because I was standing at, at reception, signing out, paying my bill in this interregnum period between my first call to the information department and the second. and. I got on the phone to Samasoni Peretti, who's, you know, one of these great Fijian journalists, just letting him know what was going on. And while I was there, an extraordinarily aggressive man came towards me, started yelling at me, who are you ringing, where are you ringing? Um, and I said, it's a local call. He said, that's an overseas call, turn your phone off. And I just said, Samasoni, I'll call you back. And I put the phone down and this guy just got really aggressive. I had no idea who he was. He was dressed in casual clothes. It was Easter Monday. I found out from the staff later that he dropped his daughter off to have a swim in the pool at the hotel. But I suspect he was a military man. Um, but but Samasoni, having heard that, immediately collected two other senior Fijian journalists. And they all turned up at the hotel to make sure that I was OK, thinking that this was the immigration people trying to haul me away, <coughs> which it wasn't. But then they spent the next hour with me until I went back and then five hours later when I came out they were still there outside making sure nothing had gone wrong. 